Oh, that's that. That's a good theory. That's that's a really good theory. <laughs> I know how to debunk this. <laughs> I I'm so sorry, but I can debunk this theory with a few words. Bonjour! Welcome to this. <laughs> we are going to be doing a reaction or a, a thought process, whatever. What do you call it? Like a analysis. We're going to be doing an analysis of Underscore's latest video. It's exciting. It came out like half an hour ago, and I'm I'm interested uh, to watch this because it's going to be based off of kind of Matt Pat's latest theory, and he says it's going to be about uh, FNAF World Two. So, um, I mean, I've been keeping in contact with him. He says it's going to be good. Um, he says it's his most important theory ever. So let's just get straight into it. I think we can all agree that one of the most unanswered points of FNAF's lore is the true identity of Golden Freddy. Absolutely. Or Before we begin this video, I just want to say my thoughts on Golden Freddy. Um, I definitely do think two souls are in Golden Freddy. I believe that totally. I don't believe in BB fifth or whatever that rubbish theory is. Sorry to anyone who I just offended. I do believe it's Cassidy and the bite victim. I uh, haven't gone much further with that though, but it's all been confirmed really through the uh, Fast Breath Rights books. So that's all I can say really. So where this tangent really began was with the release of The New Kid, which was the third story in 1.35am. Yeah. Got springlocked in the Golden Freddy suit, but after closer inspection, curly the body hair. had disappeared and been replaced by the body of a black, curly-haired kid. Yeah, which is, which is Cassidy. This kid was assumed to be Cassidy due to Cassidy being associated with having black hair and the Irish origins of the name Cassidy meaning curly-haired. You spot on with this. Why the idea of Kelsey being a projection from Cassidy was incorrect is because of the confirmation that there were actually two spirits in the collective of Golden Freddy. For so long, everybody had been debating if Golden Freddy... Underscore's good at explaining things, isn't he? He's, he's very good. He... He, he just talks. <laughs> he just talks, and you understand him instantly, um, as well as the imagery on the screen. It, it really conjoins together. It's really good. Really good production. This creation is a Fazbear endoskeleton, which contains the souls of two children. Jake, mm -hmm. who fell ill and likely died at his home, and Andrew, who was likely murdered yeah, by the man and one of them can lady, see, only see who is a stand-in for William Afton. Jake seems to be a stand-in for the crying child, with them both dying outside of a Fazbear Entertainment yeah. establishment mm -hmm. from a more medical-related incident, while Andrew is our stand-in for Cassidy, being that they were both killed by William Afton and are very vengeful oh, there. Couldn't agree more, couldn't agree more. It's funny, but with this realization, I think I noticed something that hasn't really been mentioned, in the Cell Rise trilogy, we hear about a long, black-haired girl named Cassidy, who is at one point murdered by William, but what was strange is that Golden Freddy had already had an identity in those books, which was the spirit of Michael Brooks. Yes. I think okay. everyone had just assumed that Cassidy was linked to Bonnie due to Jeremy's absence in the books, but we had never considered that both Michael Brooks and Cassidy could both be inhabiting Golden Freddy. I... That's a good, that's an okay theory, um, it, again, you come up with the debate of is the book trilogy an actual, like, canon or, or whatever, um, I, I'm with him on this, honestly, um, I do think it's very closely connected, um, obviously not every single point. Fast Bear Frights is more connected, um, I, I really want to see what he says about the man in room 1280, 1280. However you like to say. Though, there's still one piece of FNAF material I haven't touched on yet. FNAF World. The survival logbook. Damn it. The most important recent realization is that there are actually two spirits in the logbook, and I'm betting you can guess who the second one is. Something that was I always say a little strange. I wouldn't say it's a recent um, revelation, we just didn't really connect it to, to the pieces together. That they're both Golden Freddy, because that was absurd at that time. We Like, back then we wouldn't have said... We would have said it's Cassidy. We we never really thought Crying Child was Golden Freddy. I mean, when FNAF 4 first came out, we all thought it was a puppet. <laughs> it's a spirit saying, I can hear the sounds. It was for me. Basically stating, this spirit knows that the party was for him 
confirming that this second spirit is the crying child. Honestly, when I got the survival logbook, which I have... When I got the survival logbook, and I was going to make a video on this, I don't know why I never did, I looked through it all, and when I saw those things, it was pretty much a confirmation um, that they're both in Golden Freddy. Pretty, like, it's solid evidence. And all this stuff has been in the survival logbook for all this time, and we never really noticed it or kind of picked up on it uh, and talked about theories about it, but it's there, and it's there for a reason, like everything else. Now, if you're thinking that maybe Casty is actually the name of the crying child, then take a look at this. Basically, Did since the fifth? crying child fifth? speaks through altered fifth. text, then that means he asks the alternate spirit, who are you and what is your name? Ah, that's a, that's that's a good thing to point out. Um, I don't think anybody's. I don't really think anyone's pointed that out really. Uh, the fact that in in the word search, the word jumble, uh, it says, "Who are you? What is your name?" Uh, and that's one person talking to the other. I like that. Code, I like that addition. To... Linking back to the stitch raid, the fact that Andrew isn't able to see seems to be a direct parallel to the survival logbook where the crying child states Correct. that he is also unable to yes. see. Now, I know I previously why stated that child. Andrew was parallel to Cassidy and not the crying child, but I still think that's true. My best explanation is that the roles are switched with Cassidy being in, in control of the body, while the crying child is more internal with a direct opposite of the stitch raids. Okay. The characters' okay. relations to each other really seem more based on character development and actions rather than their respective roles in the animatronics. This scenario actually works better, since Cassidy was likely stuffed into the Golden Freddy suit, while the crying child has a more spiritual connection to the collective. Though the question still stands, how and why is the crying child a part of the Golden Freddy collective? This hasn't been talked about much, but I think I've found the answer that both solves the crying child's presence in Golden Freddy, and possibly the most unanswered game in the franchise. FNAF World. Since okay. despite Here everyone's go. claims, stuff, FNAF really. World was never deemed non-canon. So, where this whole FNAF World connection begins is a small missable detail from the man in room 1280. In the man in room 1280, the spirit, Andrew, haunts a hospital where the body of the man is being kept. The man is our William stand-in, and since he likely murdered Andrew... I want to say something about this quickly. Um, I do remember talking to him about this briefly. And one thing I picked up on that he said he would go over in this is the fact that the child in the man room 1280 has an alligator mask. And that is a correlation um, with the child in the happiest day in the game, of course. Uh, but that's not really a correlation I'm looking for. I think it's more old man consequences because that is FNAF world, that is hell. Um, and it comes up in Ultimate Custom Night a lot, which is what the Man in Room 1280 is all about, so I want to see what you have to say about that, because he says he's got a bigger theory on it, but I, I can't wait to see it. ...murdered Andrew, his body is being kept alive by Andrew to eternally torment him inside of his own mind. Yeah, Ultimate Custom What's Night. What's really important about this story, however, is the fact that Andrew is seen wearing an alligator mask, which I believe is a clear parallel between Andrew and Old Man Consequences, oh. who seems to take the form of oh. an alligator. Now, that may seem like a stretch to associate two very separate No, characters, I don't think it is. But let me redirect your attention to Ultimate Custom Night to specifically focus on the Vengeful Spirit. It can't be Charlotte, because the Vengeful Spirit is shown to have a voice that differs from Charlotte's. And finally, hmm. it can't be the Crying Child, since technically, William didn't kill him. So, that only leaves Cassidy. Uh, this is how it feels. And you get to experience it over and over. I guess that's evidence for not being crying child, but forever. Still, it can I still will torment never him. Let you, leave. you know, he William wasn't the one exposed to the nightmare animatronics. Sure, they may be his creations, but um, like, crying child was still a big part of his life, and I'm sure he was kind of tormented by that too. That's probably what started this entire saga. So. I wouldn't say that's sufficient evidence to say it's not the crying child, but I do believe it's Cassidy. <laughs> the main point is the idea that maybe the crying child and Cassidy are actually separated in Ultimate Custom Night, with Cassidy as the overseeing spirit, 
and the crying child acting as a casual enemy in the form of Withered Golden Freddy. Just another interesting example that works very well. So, getting back on topic, what's the importance of Cassidy being the vegetable? I have a few problems with that. Since we know that Cassidy the is the talking to William at UCN, then that means Old Man Consequences is talking to Cassidy, and therefore connected to Andrew. Though, that's only the beginning of this massive connection tangent. So, based upon those connections I just made, it's basically confirmed that the little red bear sprite is actually Cassidy, which means that the same red bear from FNAF World is also Cassidy. Can you see how this is going to get interesting? Okay. So, okay. Cassidy's red bear in FNAF World, right? Well, that all... Yes, yes, okay, because um, Old Man Consequences says leave your demons to, to his demons, uh, aka leave William to his own creations and torment him forever or whatever. Um, and then he says, rest your soul, I think. It would make sense for it to be a conversation between Crying Child and Cassidy. Uh, I will say that. Um, we, we, look, we never really thought about who Old Man Consequences is. He just kind of appeared and we assumed he was the devil. You know, the stairway to hell. Um, or the highway to hell or whatever. <laughs> um, but he, he, it does create a connection to FNAF World, and it makes you think, is FNAF World actually canon? And I, I, I mean, I've always thought it was, but other people have thought not. I, I wonder what he says about FNAF World as, as a whole game, rather than just a part of it in Ultimate Custom Night. Based upon evidence from both scenarios, it becomes apparent that the set of eyes and glutes for bear are actually Charlotte, or the puppet who was also the spirit speaking in the flatline ending of FNAF 4 as the Fredbear plush. Right. The similarities between Glitch Fredbear and the Fredbear plush are visually obvious, but the similarities between the plush and the eyes seem to be more based upon their actions. In the ending of FNAF 4, Charlotte takes the form of the crime child's beloved Fredbear plush in order to gain his trust and actually repeat some lines from that ending such as, we are still your friends, and I will put you back together. Okay. Though, what really is this that, yeah. is the shared eye and text color similarities between all three of them. Something that was always really weird about the Fredbear plush is that through every the text game color. but the final one, the plush talks in the text color hashtag FFFF57, F. while F in, in that please. final minigame, it speaks in the hex code Hashtag FFFFA0, which ah, is a I slightly yeah. lighter yellow tone. So it's a different thing in the Fredbear plush, essentially what he's saying. Um, yes, why the puppet? Maybe he's explained that already, but I, I missed it or something, I don't know. Which matches very closely with Glitch Fredbear and the eyes in FNAF World. The speaker prior to Charlotte speaking in the ending is confirmed to be William through the plushie being revealed as a surveillance device in the official location's private room, and William being linked to the color orange in both Midnight Motors. But why? And why is the last one Charlotte? So I think with everything explained, it's time to finally get to the point of the clock okay. ending. I probably missed exactly it. I'm the sorry. Child became a part of Golden Freddy. So in the beginning of FNAF World, Charlotte instructs the crying child that she will put him back together. But what does that have to do with Cassidy? Well, it relates to something very strange that Charlotte tells Cassidy as Glitch Fredbear. This is a safe place, a sanctuary. The truth is, there is no safe place. You don't understand that. You were made for one thing. What this line tells me is exactly what we needed to confirm the Crown Child's presence in Golden Freddy. This line isn't relating to Charlotte having created Cassidy, but, in fact, Charlotte having brought back Cassidy and creating Golden Freddy for one exact thing. The safety and well-being of the crying child, child's soul being housed within Golden Freddy. This idea is somehow so unexpected, yet works so well. It was apparent that the crying child was somehow important to Charlotte's plans for vengeance based on her presence during his death as the plush, for reasons I'll get into later. But it seems that Cassidy's separated soul created the perfect scenario for her to put the crying child back together with Cassidy as Golden Freddy. The other thing that's also incredible about this Golden Freddy soul collective idea is the fact that it solves so many questions and so much conflicting information, such as Golden Freddy's girlish laugh coming from Cassidy, 
which I'm assuming is a girl, yeah, I've touched and on that. the signature It's Me line coming from the crying child and being directed at his brother. At Michael, Michael yes, Afton. correct. To think that the it's game. The, that... It's the fact that, um, like, Golden Freddy can be a threat to Michael Afton and William Afton in Ultimate Cups of Night um, because of those things, because one of them, like, a part of him is um, the crying child and a part of him is Cassidy, and that, again, that's why he said there's a girl laugh. Uh, and why uh, he's essentially against William in Ultima Custom Night. Things like that um, really throw things together and, and shows that they are both a soul in, uh, in Golden Freddy. Still don't understand where the puppets come into all of this. I, I assume it's because um, I guess she can physically put things together, and I, and we know that the puppet was responsible for bringing life to the children uh, again. Um, but I don't know. Again, he probably explained it. I'm probably being really stupid. Um, but that's just one thing I'm thinking about right now. Uh, I'm trying to really kind of be harsh with this, kind of. Heck, this may even explain a question that I've pondered for quite a while, which is, why is Cassidy so vengeful? The obvious answer would be that she was involved in the immobile Golden Freddy suit, and thus separated from her friends as the lost child, but it may actually be because of Charlotte's use of her. I'd be mad too if somebody brought me back just for the purpose of aiding some other soul. Just a possible uh, I, I don't know. That's the question I've had this entire time. Why Cassidy? What's Cassidy done? What's Cassidy done to Afton? Why is she the one that you should not have killed? It's why is she the vengeful spirit? Like honestly, that's what like the thing that needs to be solved in order to solve Golden Freddy. I think, um, because I don't have a clue why she is the one to be the one you should not have killed. Uh, is it something to do with the family? Is there some kind of tension? Like agony, could be to do with a lot of agony going around. Um, I don't know. I, I really don't know. Maybe he could be right in saying uh, it's because, uh, like, she's protecting crying child or whatever. Like, you know what I'm trying to say. I'm just not saying it right. <laughs> I'll it's let it go. I now need to propose valid explanations surrounding Shadow Freddy oh, no. and the nightmare scenarios of FNAF 4. Oh no! Now, a very interesting... No, don't do that. Don't touch on that. I, If you didn't know, I've basically been trying to avoid any theories with Shadow Freddy and any theories with the nightmares in. I haven't even done FNAF on solves on any of them. Um, I probably should have. I probably should have covered it a little bit, but I have no idea about any of them, so um, fire away. <laughs> See how far you get. FNAF World has loading screens based upon just about every playable character, right. including renders right. and, and what Shadow Freddy is going to say. But I feel Scott got very secretive and lore involved with the design of Adventure Shadow Freddy. Two interesting details about Shadow Freddy are his quote reading, I will eat your soul, and the strange detail he's got two... of his jaw being Yeah, I was about to say, he's broken. got two jaws. These two details, when applied together, I will eat your soul. seem to relate to the crying child, and specifically about the bite of 83, where Fredbear's jaw would have likely ended up broken, and Fredbear having symbolically eaten the crying child's soul by killing him. I think that is the key to solving Shadow Freddy as well. Like, we haven't had much information on Shadow Freddy, but FNAF World, like, he is there in FNAF World. I will eat your soul. He's also got the two teeth, like, the jaw at the back. Uh, could be symbolic of, of the Nightmare animatronics. I mean, Chica, I'm pretty sure Nightmare Chica has two jaws. Uh, also, we know, like, Nightmare has like teeth here um, around his stomach uh, people have been saying a lot like connecting uh, Shadow Freddy with the nightmares um, could be nightmare in general people have always been connecting lefty to the nightmares I don't see that personally but okay <laughs> well I have the suspicion that the crying child may be Shadow Freddy but that doesn't mean he can't also be a part of Golden Freddy it's actually relating to an idea that I proposed and then dissed earlier, relating to the new kid. 
I used the example of Kelsey being a projection from Cassidy as an example of what I got wrong, but it may actually support the idea of Shadow Freddy being a projection of the Crying Child. Since the Crying Child's role in Golden Freddy excludes him from the physical appearance, would it be too implausible for him to somehow gain the power to create a projection? The Crying Child is technically living in the shadow of Cassidy as the physical form of Golden Freddy, and him being both the literal and metaphorical shadow of Golden Freddy would make sense. Now, this is where the question I sought to answer earlier comes into play. What importance does the Crying Child have to Charlotte's plan? Well, it seems that the question gets primarily answered in those Springlock minigames from FNAF 3, where Shadow Freddy uses his spiritual form mm. to lure the animatronics while mm. staying invisible to William Afton. Yes, because the Vengeful Spirit With the extreme likelihood that those Springlock minigames take place after the closure of the last Freddy Fazbear's Pizza in 1993, I would assume that in 1997, at the FNAF 2 location, the That's Crying so. Child has barely learned to control his projectional power while by 1993, he has full control over the form of Shadow Freddy. It's so crazy to think of the Okay, okay, I, I get where he's going with this. I get where he's going with this. I want to ask him, and it's kind of ironic that I'm asking underscore this, um, what does this mean for Shadow Bonnie? What does it mean for Shadow Bonnie? What is Shadow Bonnie? Um, actually, that can kind of be answered by FNAF AR. I don't know, I'll need to think about this a little bit more, obviously. I'm just saying my thoughts right now. What is Shadow Body got to do with this? Because, yeah, Shadow Freddy may be a kind of projection of Golden Freddy and Cassidy, um, like, like an image of Cassidy and Crying Child following in her footsteps or something. But what is Shadow Body got to do with it? Because Shadow Body is a, a projection of Spring Body. So... Don't know that, don't know that, but um, I like where he's going with this. It's time to talk about the FNAF 4 gameplay. Oh no. This may seem like a weird place to jump to, but hear me out. Due to some behavior expressed by William Afton towards the crying child and the private room password of 1983, it's assumed that at one point or another, the crying child was taken down to the facility forcefully by William and got to experience the nightmarish illusions against his own will. As a, as a form of punishment, really. I'm not exactly certain when or how the Crying Child experienced these observational rooms, but me, he may have at some point before his death. Mm -hmm. Now, with all that explained, it would have been weird to claim that the gameplay we see in FNAF isn't those scenarios if it weren't for one small detail included in the nightly ambience. The audio clip you're currently hearing is random ambience and background noise, but when reversed is actually a clip of the FNAF 1 phone call, and with the fact that Scott didn't fill FNAF 4 with random easter eggs, it must be important. Oh yeah. Well, I think an interesting detail from the survival logbook precisely pins down exactly who, Where is he going when, with this? and why these nightmares are happening. In Michael Afton's logbook, under a section relating to recent dreams, yeah, he draws a depiction yeah. of okay. Nightmare Fredbear. Things get very speculative here, but consider this theoretical scenario. Michael Afton takes the night shift at Freddy's in 1993 and has run-ins with the animatronics, including his deceased brother the Crying Child as Golden Freddy. Okay. Either after his shifts or after his week is over, he begins to experience the nightmarish scenarios from the perspective of the Crying Child, basically being cursed with visions of these scenarios that their father forced his younger son into. These visions get a little blurry, being slightly mixed with memories of Phone Guy's phone call from night one, but major- I now have to debunk this. <laughs> I, I'm i so sorry, but I can debunk this theory with a few words. Um, I'm not going to say a few words, I'm going to say quite a lot of words. Um, he's saying, uh, if I'm being, if I'm right in thinking this, he is saying after the FNAF 1 shifts, he goes back home and he's essentially having nightmares or torments uh, from his brother's perspective. Um, well, the FNAF 1 shifts are from 12am to 6am, but the FNAF 4 shifts are also from 12am to 6am, so they can't both happen one after the other, if you know what I'm saying. 
Um, that's my first thought on it. Um, if he's if he's going with that theory, um, because you can't do two things at once, essentially. Um, I I know I know what he's trying to say, and I know what I'm trying to say. I'm just not very good at speaking like underscores. Um, but yeah, that's my thoughts with it right now. Majorly distorted. The nightmarish memories that the crying child forces onto Michael may just be to show him the true crimes of their father, but it may have also been payback and vengeance for him getting killed in the first place. Now, let me explain a little something that may lead to confirmation of the latter. Earlier, I showed off that the Sish Locations Breaker Room map with animatronics marked on the map, but one thing I left out was the fact that Nightmare and Nightmare Fredbear, which is one of the characters that Michael drew, is noticeably absent from the map. Oh no. So where did they come from? Oh no. Well, due to a little detail <laughs> in the game files of FNAF 4, I've considered the idea that Nightmare and Nightmare Fredbear may actually be the crime child and Cassidy entering Michael's fort. Oh. That's that That's a good theory. That's that's a really good theory. <laughs> and then my camera died. Uh, <laughs> I was about to say an amazing theory. L literally, I, I've thought about it since I I last uh, stopped recording. Literally, it's a great theory. And I don't know why nobody's ever really thought about it before. But if you're saying that Crying Child is Shadow Freddy, Cassidy is Golden Freddy, mainly, um, and you're saying that Cassidy is Nightmare Golden Freddy, and Crying Child is Nightmare, they relate so much. Like, there's such a big correlation there, and I think he is spot on. Spot on. Maybe not with the timing of FNAF 4. Um, although I do see it taking place at the same time as FNAF 1, um, maybe in a different sense. I don't know. I think the location and and, and the placement um, and timing of FNAF 4 is really off to me. Like, I don't understand any of it. Um, I don't think anybody does. Um, but I think he's got this bang on. I think his identities are... Like, like, it creates so many explanations for so many different things, so I, I do think he's right there, and that's amazing. That is really amazing. Um, good job, honestly. I've never seen this theory before, and if you got it from someone else, I'll be hunting you down. <laughs> but if this is you, underscore, top notch, top notch. That little detail in the game files just so happens to be files for Nightmare being titled Shadow Freddy. Yes. Leading to strong connections yes. between the crime child and That's Nightmare why I, I did also say since the they've released. got strong connections. Oh. It's such a strange idea, but this idea of Cassidy and the crime child tormenting Michael with his, their nightmarish dreamscapes may have actually been Cassidy testing out her torment ability before fully utilizing it on William in Ultimate Custom um, Notice that if Cassidy is Nightmare Freddy... I think that's a bit cheesy, personally. Um... I don't think she needs to test out on on Michael. Um, actually, yeah, it is it is a bit strange that Cassidy is almost there, but um, it it works. The theory works. Now, finally, I'm done rambling, but that doesn't mean you're done just yet. I'll finish off this video with two questions: one that's based on your reasoning, and the other being a yet unsolved. Why why, why are you asking us questions? <laughs> The first okay. question is, who do you think gets their happiest day here, Cassidy or the crime child? I personally think it's the crime child, but there so is evidence from either side. So do I, because so it was his birthday. It was his birthday and it was ruined by him, oh, you know. Um, <laughs> we won't talk about that incident. I do think it's crime child because of the party in FNAF 4 and he never got his happiest day, essentially. Um, that's all my thoughts on that. I don't think it would have been Cassidy. She doesn't really... She doesn't need a happiest day. I'd like to hear your reason. That sounded really bad. The second question is, what is the crying child's name? Since that's really the only remaining unsolved mystery relating to this. 
and no, no. maybe get a closer look at the logbook. There are other dashes that never really got concluded, That's very true. so maybe keep looking on those. I expect to never hear the name Chris be brought up in the comments. Also, thank you to Cuban Fancy for the Golden Freddy Render oh. and Casty Sprites. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video because I put a lot of work into it. I did, I did. He said it was going to be 20 minutes long. It's 25 minutes long. Um, I really enjoyed that. Um, Underscore's videos are amazing, honestly. Um, he just needs more. He, you need more. Um, not Chris. It's not Chris Afton. Uh, he doesn't have a name at the moment. He, he doesn't have a name. I swear to God, though, if it's like Mike, if like one of them is Michael and the other one's Mike, I'm going to actually throw myself out a window. Um, <laughs> that was serious. I will eat my hat. Uh, and honestly, that has given me a little bit of motivation to look through the logbook. Um, but I really do need to do that. And actually, he's right. There are a few mysteries in the logbook that aren't fully solved. <laughs> honestly, there's still loads of random numbers and it could be the identity of the crying child. Um, we just have to see. Just have to keep looking, keep thinking, because honestly, this could have been solved ages ago. This is the first time I've seen anyone really say this. Um, so <laughs> it takes a while for us to get things, but we're getting there eventually. Um, so thank you so much for watching. Uh, please, please, please subscribe. Thank you to everybody who's become a member. I appreciate that so much, and I will see you all later. Goodbye!